Hello, Microbe Gal Nation, and welcome to another episode of The Micro Moment, that show that takes you down to the microscopic level to view the world just a little bit differently. I'm your host, Tess, and today we have an interview with Michael Weinstein. Now, Michael Weinstein is a bioinformatician at Zymo Research. If you've been listening to the show for a bit, you know that Zymo is one of our sponsors, and I wanted to take a moment to tell you my story of Zymo. Many years ago, when I was a baby PhD student, my professor bestowed upon me a project that was of mutual interest to the both of us. During my undergrad, I had extracted DNA from a number of samples, humans, oyster, water, roots, fruits, and animals. I never had a problem with any of them. I didn't think I'd have a problem with my PhD. But oh, was I wrong. Like so many undergrads transitioning to grad school, my PhD revolved around woody grapevine tissue, which is extremely low biomass. Like there's almost nothing there. I struggled for months, literally living the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. But they never came. Until one day, I went to a vendor fair And I might say this vendor fair changed my life. Is that too dramatic to say? Well, I walked in, and what do I see but cupcakes? Of course, I headed straight to the table, and as I got closer, I realized these weren't just any cupcakes. They were chocolate cupcakes with a thick brown swirl of chocolate frosting with two little googly eyes on them. That's right. They were poop emoji cupcakes to celebrate Zymobiomics DNA purification kits. I left there with not only my poop emoji cupcake, which you know, of course I had half, and it was delicious, I know you're dying to know, but also a sample. And I compared the Zymobiomics DNA extraction kit to a handful of other kits. And consistently, it produced high quality and high yields on my low biomass woody tissue that I could barely extract DNA from with some other kits. And so that's my story. I started using Zymobiomics kits and poof, Four years later, I got a PhD. Well, okay, there was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Oh, and fire. (laughs) Lots of fire in between that time. At any rate, I'm so grateful for them for sponsoring the podcast. And I hope you will enjoy this little segment with Michael Weinstein, where we talk about all sorts of things from his research in bioinformatics at Zymo, as well as his teaching at UCLA, and a number of different projects that he's been involved in from COVID and beyond in the past years. So without further ado, Michael, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work at Zymo? So I am on the bioinformatics and microbiome uh, teams at Zymo Research. My major focus is bioinformatics on the microbiome, but I apply that actually all the way back in the pipeline to things like better kit design, better license practices, um, and then usually take that forward again and come up with better tools to kind of analyze the accuracy of microbiome preps and that sort of thing. I'm also adjunct faculty at UCLA, and there I teach a couple of different bioinformatics workshops. Um, I've been doing that for several years now. Uh, My workshops at UCLA include intro to next generation sequencing technology, advanced Python programming, and I recently took over the 16S uh, microbiome course. Cool. Wow, that's quite a lot. So can you tell us a little bit about what bioinformatics is in the context of the microbiome? Sure. So in the context of the microbiome, there's quite a few different bioinformatics challenges. In microbiome, there's a couple of different key ways of looking at the microbes. So one of them is what's called 16S, uh, usually. The more general term for it is targeted or amplicon sequencing, which is looking at a very specific region that's going to be shared by a bunch of different organisms in your desired kingdom. So for example, in bacteria, that's typically the 16S ribosomal RNA, which pretty much all bacteria are going to have. Um, I don't know of any that get away without having that. Um, Can't really imagine any that would get away without having that. It's important. Um, yes. Some would say it's central. <laughs> I would say so. Uh, if you're looking at fungi, you're probably going to look at either eight, at either 18S um, RNA or even a specific portion of that called the ITS. And if you're looking at just general eukaryotes, probably the 18S RNA is a good one. Uh, but in all these cases, you're looking for a region where you have some, some highly conserved areas that you can do PCR primers to, which gives you something to amplify. And what you're amplifying are the variable regions between them. And you're using that as kind of a barcode, or what I like to say is more of a name tag for the microbe. 
And so typically with that, you can say, you can kind of name the microbe, um, much like a name tag. I can't necessarily say what it's doing there or how important a role it's playing, but I can identify that it's there. And depending on who I see, maybe I can make a few inferences about it. Um, so one of the challenges there is if you're dealing with the kind of the name tag approach, a lot of microbes are gonna have very similar sequences. And a lot of times you're making a call even down to the species level based on just a couple of uh, different letters in the DNA sequence. So sorting out what's really diversity versus what is essentially noise. So, you know, imperfect sequencing, imperfect PCR, trying to separate those things is one of the bioinformatic challenges. And so when we're saying amplicon, how, how big of a piece of DNA are we talking about here? Uh, so that can vary. Um, a lot of the early sequencing for things like the uh, Earth Microbiome Project were focused on just one very sh uh, relatively short region of the uh, 16S called uh, variable region number four. Sort of tougher technique, but one that gives you more information is amplifying from upstream of variable region three to downstream of variable region four. Or occasionally I've seen people even go from upstream of variable region one to downstream of variable region three. So I've seen people talk about doing, uh, so usually people call a variable region just V. So I've seen people do V1, V2, occasionally V1 through V3. And my personal favorite region is V3 through V4. Why is it your favorite? It gives, it's kind of my first go-to if I want to see, you know, if I want to get good high resolution on a reliable region as to what's there. Uh, it's definitely not the best choice for everybody. Uh, so just an example for people studying the oral microbiome. Because oral microbiome, it's very important to be able to distinguish between, for example, identify S. pyogenes versus other similar species. V, V1, you know, V1, V2, V3 tend to be better for that. So they tend to do those regions. But for me, it's V3, V4. That's usually what I cover. That's kind of the Zymo standard. And it gives pretty good behavior. Yeah. So would you say you pri primarily are involved in bacterial microbiomes, or would you say you're 50-50 between bacterial and fungal? I'm still primarily bacterial microbiomes. Um, the bacterial references tend to be a lot better. People are still very focused on bacteria. I honestly wish I was seeing a lot more fungal microbiomes. I think the importance of fungi is kind of underestimated at this point. And a lot of times it's not because fungi are unimportant. I think they're actually very important. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, but it's more a case of, um, so fungi have a very tough, a lot of them have a very tough chitin cell wall or shell around them. Other things that have a tough kite and shell around them include lobsters, which, you know, known for having a really tough shell. And something else that's not really appreciated as much in microbiome is in order to really detect something and quantify it accurately, you have to be able to completely lyse it while leaving its DNA intact enough to detect. Right. And that's, that's kind of been one of my major focuses for the last... Um, it got a little bit deprioritized during COVID because I've kind of been shifted over to COVID related responsibilities, but especially before COVID, that was probably my biggest um, focus was how to make, basically how to make lysis easier and better. Mm -hmm. So, so was Zymo getting into COVID testing or is that at UCLA that you got into more COVID related project? Uh, so it's a little bit of both actually. Um, so Zymo makes a reagent called DNA RNA shield. Mm -hmm. uh, DNA RNA shield is actually kind of awesome stuff. Um, for those who can appreciate how unstable RNA is in either a microbiome or just a mammalian sample, I've seen the test, you know, we've done the testing here. We can show that RNA is stabilized in a fecal sample in shield at room temperature for about a month, um, at least. Wow. And anybody who's worked with RNA has a strong appreciation for how unstable RNA is, especially in the context of other biological material like fecal matter where it's going to typically be broken down very quickly. Um, but the other thing that uh, DNA RNA shield is good at is it also tends to denature things and it's especially good at denaturing uh, pathogen proteins. So most pathogens that go into DNA RNA shield, and I believe that includes uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, but it's been, it's been tested against a very large number of viruses. Um, viruses that go in there tend not to um, come out active. So it's, it's been popular for that use. We also make viral RNA extraction kits that have been used for the extractions for um, SARS-CoV-2 testing. And we also make testing reagents. So some of the, some of the qPCR primers and master mixes. 
and we and we work with a large number of clinical labs to kind of make sure that our stuff is on point all the time. Right. Yeah. Don't want it to be off for sure. Yeah. And then I also wound up sort of almost by accident helping out with the state of California with COVID reporting. Uh huh. How how did you wind up with that? So I was helping a clinical lab, and I discovered early on that. Um, there were two ways people were reporting COVID cases to the state of California. Uh, one of them was through basically a web API, so electronic reporting system. Uh, people had a lot of trouble connecting to that one. Usually it involved customizing a, a, limb, a lab information system. Only a few labs really had that. Mm-hmm. And it was actually a system that was previously used for uh, testing, for reporting sexually transmitted infections to the state. So sexually transmitted infections are kind of the original reportable disease to public health. And this was the electronic system for reporting them. So the labs that were connected were mostly some of the big ones that were just doing high volume STI testing. Mm -hmm. And then the state said, you know, we don't want to get a call every time you have a positive COVID case because now we're in the middle of a pandemic and our phones are going to ring off the hook. Right. So they said, can you just report them through the electronic gateway that is normally used for STI testing? But only a few labs were connected to that. And it turned out a lot of labs could not get connected to it very quickly. So a lot of labs were actually reporting by sending spreadsheets to the state. Oh, man, that sounds messy. So that was the other way of reporting. And it turns out there was an automation on that. So when somebody reported their cases via spreadsheet, somebody at the state level had to actually copy paste that into the database. Ooh, that that does not sound like a good job. No. Um, Very prone to error. <laughs> well, actually, worse than that, if you think about it, Um, So this was back in June or July of, this was back, yeah, I started this in uh, late June of last year, worked through July on it. So this is really when the pandemic and the testing were getting into kind of full swing. Mm -hmm. And every day you had more labs going online doing testing. And every day the labs that were online doing testing were doing more testing per day. You basically can't hire data entry specialists fast enough to keep up with something like that, because really it seemed like testing levels at that point were almost on an exponential curve. Right. And data and, and hiring more data entry people is something that's really just kind of a linear, a linear solution at best. Mm-hmm. So I have kind of my background also, I have a background in cybersecurity. And I was able to leverage both my understanding of how kind of lab test reporting works, as well as the cybersecurity aspects of how to deal with unfriendly web APIs. And I ended up over the course of about a week writing a standalone client for uploading data to the state. Oh, wow. Got basically a couple of labs, including uh, one of UCLA's labs, actually, uh, online for data upload. And then, and actually the funny thing was the UCLA lab, they didn't actually know I was doing this. (laughs) But they were happy when they found out, though. They were very happy when they found out. So the funny thing is the person who was running... Uh, that portion of it is actually an old friend of mine. He's a professor who I've known since I was an undergrad there, which was a fairly long time ago. He didn't know I was working on this, and I didn't know he was working on COVID testing, but it actually just so happened that I was teaching that week, and one of one of his students was actually in my class and mentioned that he's working on, on developing a, a COVID test on campus, and I said, oh, okay, how are you doing, your, you know, how are you handling your reporting to the state? Student didn't know this, so I said, just, you know, let this professor know I, I have this tech I'm working on right now. Um, if it's going to be useful, just uh, shoot me a ping and I'll get you set up on it. And sure enough, I got them set up. And the next thing that happened, the state, act, um, some people from the state actually contacted me and asked if my program could read a different file format than I had been using. They sent me the file. They were wondering if I could read. I said, oh, this looks like one of your reporting files. Mm-hmm. And they said, yeah. I said, so you don't have any automation on this. And they kind of didn't want to admit that they had that basically everything was still manual input at that point. So I ended up modifying my program to be able to read their input files. <laughs> and then actually right at the beginning of August last year, we had basically a working system and they just start using my program on the files that they're being sent as well as the files they'd already been sent where they were kind of building up a pretty noticeable backlog. And so I think it was like, we cleared something like 300,000 files over the weekend. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, it was like 300,000 backlog files plus whatever was coming in. Ends up actually overloading uh, one of the downstream applications. They had a little bit of data loss there, but they sorted that out pretty quickly. Uh Last I checked, this 
system still in use for reporting? Uh, I think I had like 800 and change. Uh, do you know what a CLIA number is? No. That's kind of a unique lab identifier. It's basically the number that the lab gets on their license. Uh -huh. um, so last I checked, there were about 800 and change CLIA numbers uh, that were somehow reporting through the system. Wow. Yeah, so it's had a big impact. Yeah, it kind of got me interested in epidemiology and public health kind of the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that seems like a, a very roundabout way to get there, but uh, it sounds like amazing work and it's impressive that you you did it. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that are very happy with with the fact that that got done. It, I think it's helped a few people out at least. Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting because a lot of people were still shocked that I just kind of said, I'm just open sourcing this thing. It's an emergency. I'm not going to try. I'll monetize something else some other day. I'm not going to try and I'm not going to try and sell this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's good too. Yeah, we all kind of needed needed everyone to come together last year and and put our put our resources together as much as possible. So, do you think they'll use it for something different in the future, or just um, will they continue using it as the pandemic winds down? The software right now it's kind of just focused for the pandemic. It wouldn't be too hard to modify it to start reporting other things like you know like go back and report STIs. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I wouldn't have, a, I wouldn't, it wouldn't even be difficult for me to modify it to just handle general purpose reporting. And it would probably be of some use to a lot of labs to do that. So I may, I may consider that when the pandemic's over and I have a little bit more time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. We'll see where that goes. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that was, that was an, that was sort of an interesting sidetrack, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Definitely interesting. Yeah. So uh, going back to the microbiome stuff. So I guess, yeah. Uh, Lysis bias has been kind of a big thing for me. Um, and I know you, you actually mentioned this a couple episodes ago on the, uh, on the uh, Alexander Fleming episode. Ooh, good callback. About the fact that gram-negative bacteria have an inner membrane, a relatively thin uh, peptidoglycan cell wall, and then an outer membrane. And it makes them resistant to a lot of things because they kind of have this nice periplasmic space and they have a couple membranes where they can kind of either pump stuff directly out or exclude stuff they don't want. Mm -hmm. So it makes them resistant to a lot of chemicals that, that would otherwise just be able to kind of freely diffuse in. But it makes them physically kind of wimpy because instead of being mostly tough peptidoglycan cell wall, they're mostly flimsy membrane. And if you, you know, if you abuse it with, you know, any kind of physical force, or if you just even throw detergent at it, it just kind of falls apart on you. Yeah. And this is one of the things that I think people don't completely realize about E. coli is, you know, why do we like grow, why do we like growing plasmids so much in E. coli? Well, you know, they're easy to grow, they're cheap, they're readily available, and they very, especially the laboratory strains, very readily take up plasmid. But I think what people don't fully appreciate is you can also very easily get your plasmid back out of the cells. Um, doesn't end up working out so well for the cells, but you do your typical alkaline and detergent lysis and the cells pretty much 100% just disintegrate on you and just leave behind all their DNA. It would be a much different story if, for example, we were trying to grow up plasmids in listeria mm -hmm. because listeria is almost like a microbial brick. I love that description. It's it's incredibly tough. So I was, I was at the uh, International Association for Food Protection meeting uh, recently and listeria is a constant worry in food production. And one of the reasons it's so bad is it shows up a lot of times in things like deli meats, hard cheeses, frozen foods, typically places that are designed to be kind of a harsh environment for microbes and kind of inhospitable. But listeria will, listeria just kind of hangs around in them, survives. And then when somebody eats it, it can basically come back alive and be pathogenic. So really tough. And really the only way I find to, very reliably lice them is you really need to hit them with something. So typically beads. Um, and in fact, even the type of beads matter because for example, glass beads, even though glass beads seem incredibly hard, they're actually even a little bit too soft for this. Um, even, the gar even the synthetic garnet beads that people like are a little bit too soft. Really what I find are it takes, um, it takes kind of these ultra hard ceramics like you would expect to find for um, Kind of these more high tech mm -hmm. applications, and so so that that's what Zymo uses, right? You guys have two different size beads in, in your kits, right? Yeah. So I have actually some data show. I have some really cool data showing just different. We actually did a study where we used dozens of different bead sizes, materials, um, even different bead beaters. Uh -huh. Yeah, that'll make a difference too. <laughs> 
Yeah. And one of the things we did that was unusual was we, since we make microbial standards with known compositions in known relative abundances and known uh, manufacturing tolerances, I actually made an automated bioinformatics pipeline where I could just take my raw sequencing reads from one of these, um, in this case, 16S, run it. Actually, it was 16S and shotgun. The, the pipeline can handle both. And I think we, and yeah, we ran both definitely. Um, run the raw reads through this pipeline and it actually spits out a score at the end, as well as a couple of charts showing where there were different biases. And so the microbes in the, in the standard, we have um, kind of at the hard to lice end, we have listeria, we have enterococcus, we have uh, bacillus subtilis, and at the easier, oh, and then if you're, if you're also looking at either shotgun or um, 16S plus 18S, you'll also see uh, saccharomyces and cryptococcus in there. And those are some of the toughest to lice. And then at the easy to lice end, uh, basically the gram negatives. So salmonella, E. coli, and uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Right. And I can just look at the relative ratios of these and tell, for example, if I see if I see way too much of the gram negatives and underrepresentation of the gram positives, that pretty much indicates a wimpy lysis procedure. Mm-hmm. It was one of the most cool things about it was so just by using different types of beads. Some of the better performing beads, I saw a four to one ratio of, so in a fecal sample, you'll see um, your two predominant phyla are going to be um, Firmicute. Yeah, Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes. And the name Firmicute actually comes from firma, meaning tough, and cutis, meaning skin. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, because literally the first thing they figured out about about those bacteria before they knew anything else about them was, man, these suckers are tough. Yeah, <laughs> they are. <laughs> um, and yeah, and they have they have really thick, you know, they have the really thick gram positive cell wall, um, and includes things like listeria and bacillus and other things that are just, you know, you you can boil them for ten minutes and they're going to be dead, but you will actually not break open most of the cells. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the examples I like to give is if I took a if I took a sample that was fifty fifty E. coli and listeria and just boiled it for ten minutes, maybe even with a little bit of detergent, I'd kill everything in there. And I think something people don't always appreciate is that killing and lysis are frequently considered essentially the same. But for microbiome, it's important to actually distinguish between I killed everything and nothing here is viable anymore versus I definitely lysed everything open. And the example I like to give people is, you know, if I boil a tube that's 50-50 coli and listeria and then did a microbiome prep on it afterwards, I would actually think my sample is probably closer to 95% E. coli because a lot of those listeria, even though they all died, uh, from boiling, they didn't actually pop open. So when I flush out my essentially bacterial garbage at the end, a lot of those are intact cells with intact uh, listeria DNA inside. And that never made it to analysis. Yeah. So can you ever get the flip side where you're just pulverizing the DNA so much that you are end up with too much gram positive and you lose the gram negative DNA because it just gets shredded? Or does that not really happen with the beads? That won't happen so much with the beads. Really with the beads. So one of the things that actually happens with the beads, especially if you're using the uh, ultra hard ceramics, if you over bead beat, you just tend to lose your sample entirely. The positive and the negative? Yeah. What's going to happen if you if you really overdo it with the bead beating, you're going to have a few possible things happen. Uh, none of them are going to be very good. <laughs> so one of the things is these bead, um, because these beads are so hard, you have these very inelastic collisions happening, which means you don't have a lot of the energy going into just sort of deforming the beads. So that energy actually becomes heat. And if you use one of these more, um, if you use kind of one of these more energetic bead beaters, imagine you probably don't want me throwing out a bunch of brand names on the show, so I won't. But you can can tell the more energetic bead beaters from the less energetic bead beaters by the fact, uh, essentially just, can you hear it running from across the lab? Yeah, there are definitely some loud ones out there. Yeah. And there's certain ones where you can hear the thing running from across the lab and even down the hall. And those are the more energetic ones. So it's, it's just pumping more energy into this, you know, into the tube, you know, more kinetic energy into the tube over a given amount of time. And then you have less energetic ones like the, uh, like the horizontal adapters for, uh, for vortexers. You can't hear those running from across the lab and they're clearly pumping less energy into the tube over a given amount of time. It turns out the more energetic ones, you only want to run them for maybe 45 seconds at a time and then let the tubes cool down because they'll start getting very hot. The less energetic ones like vor- like the uh, Vortex adapter, that's a little bit more uh, gentle. Right. And it turns out the heat kind of comes off the tube fast enough to uh, 
that the two nothing too terrible is going to happen. But if you just try to run on one of those really energetic devices for you know a full five minute uh, lysis cycle mm-hmm. uh, without sort of stopping to let it cool down, your sample is probably going to degrade from all that internal heat buildup. But you're also probably going to have your sample start boiling from the internal heat buildup. Uh, your tube itself is going to overheat and probably weaken, and uh, you will probably wind up with microbiome sample painting the interior of your uh, feed meter. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a little torture chamber for for microbes. Not only are you pulverizing them with beads, and then you're boiling them alive. <laughs> yeah. Now the now the situation I've seen where people can wind up with with overrepresentation of gram positives is actually freeze thaw either freeze thaw or, um, or chemical slash enzymatic lysis. And what will happen there is uh, for the purpose of this bacteria only really contain two things that I care about uh, for this kind of discussion. And it's, they're going to contain enzymes that basically break down DNA and RNA. So they contain nucleases and they contain their nucleic acids. And the good thing is no bacteria is going to contain nucleases that are going to chop up its own genome because obviously it's a very bad thing to have, and evolution uh, makes sure those don't last uh, very long. Um, but they do contain enzymes that will chop up other bacterial genomes. So, in the case of freeze thaw, bacteria, and I know I know you're on the East Coast, so you probably have an appreciation for what happens to pipes when it's uh, cold out. <laughs> yeah, I sure do. <laughs> yeah, and bacteria will do basically the same thing. If you freeze bacteria, you know, if the water inside the cell freezes, it can very easily rupture the cell. Now, if you're a gram negative cell, again, you're held together mostly by membrane. So you're essentially a pipe made of, you know, you're basically like a softer PVC pipe. And if you're gram positive bacteria, you have a much thicker cell wall, you're much more resistant to physical stress. So you're more like kind of a, you know, you're kind of a very thick walled lead pipe. So the weaker ones are going to are going to basically pop at a higher rate than the stronger ones. And at this point, you actually don't have any problem. At this point, a lot of your bacteria are lysed. You you do have potential for bias because they're differentially lysed at this point. You've lysed a lot of the gram negatives, but not the gram positives. But if you start, if you let that sample thaw, you now have all the gram positive DNA being protected by still being inside of an intact cell because they popped at a lower rate. Since you popped a lot of the gram negatives, their DNA is actually all being chopped up by the fact that you now have just this mix of lysed cell. So a lot of gram negative DNA was released along with a lot of um, both gram negative and gram positive, um, but especially gram negative uh, nucleases. So as soon as it thaws and the enzymes come back to life because they're at their uh, chosen temperatures, you're gonna have pretty much instantly starting a breakdown of gram of all that free DNA. And because you selectively lyse gram negatives, you're gonna lose a lot of gram negative DNA. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, so what's your, what's your rule for freeze thaw? Is it one and done or can you go a couple times? That's another case where, you know, going back, I like, I like the use of DNA RNA shield, especially, um, and basically there's a few different chemicals people can use to do, um, to do preservation. Um, there's quite a few commercial preservatives. One of the things I like about, uh, DNA RNA shield in particular is it goes right into the prep. If you are using a different preservative, one where you actually have to get rid of the preservative because it'll uh, mess up your extraction, then a lot of that DNA again from the lysed cells is just going to be in kind of in solution. And when you get rid of your preservative, you still wind up getting rid of the DNA. So something, so something like DNA RNA shield where you can actually put it directly into the uh, lysis process uh, without having to get rid of anything means that basically the the degraded enzymes and nucleases are all pretty much inhibited by the shield. But at the same time, you're still preserving everything and you can still extract it all from the shield. You don't wind up putting in bias due to the freeze thaw. You know, stuff stuff still lyses in shield. It lyses when you freeze it, but the DNA is preserved and therefore you can just extract it for analysis later. So nothing's lost and everything's preserved. Yeah. So with the shield, I'm always curious because I think everything is optimized for humans because that's where the most money is and the most research is. Have you tested it on other environments and have you found any sample types or environments that perhaps the shield doesn't work as well as, or it seems to work with everything you tested on? Well, of course, my number one thing I always tell people with shield is don't mix it with bleach. So if you're working with something that has bleach in it, or I know there's certain minerals that basically when you dissolve them, they essentially become a 
hypochloride, they, they become basically bleach. If you're working with a sample like that, definitely don't use shield because that will cause some unpleasant chemical reactions and you have to evacuate your lab for like a good little while. That's no good. This week's episode of The Micro Moment is brought to you by Zymo Research. Accurate and reproducible microbiome analysis relies on well-defined mock community standards as well as optimized methods for sample collection, nucleic acid extraction, library prep, and bioinformatics. Check out Zymo's complete microbiome workflow at zymoresearch.com. That's Z-Y-M-O-R-E-S-E. E-A-R-C-H dot com. Uh, yeah, going back to what you asked before, I, I don't know of too many sample types that won't work with S.H.I.E.L.D. I'm right now also doing some work on wastewater. So basically taking sewage, taking wastewater, trying to, um, among other things, trying to look at, can we quantify the COVID and waste? Can we quantify COVID genomes in wastewater? And can we even maybe identify some of the specific mutants that are becoming predominant through wastewater? Yeah, I think the research in that is just incredible that we can kind of do this back end, pun intended, epidemiology approach to um, public health. I just think that's amazing to just think about. Yeah. And unfortunately, the chemistry of wastewater is very difficult in part because it's just genu- genuinely kind of a nasty sample, but it's also a highly variable sample. And changes daily and hourly, I'm sure. It changes daily, but also, um, you know, sometimes your sewer shed, you might have a lot of farmland. And in that case, you're going to have, you know, along with potentially animal waste, um, you're also looking at probably a lot of agricultural chemical runoff. So pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, that kind of thing. Versus, you know, if you're doing an urban area, you're going to have, you know, you're going to be much more rich for human waste, which is probably what you're most interested in anyway, but you may be at a much higher concentration of it. So trying to work around, trying to kind of work around those things and come up with systems that are adaptable for those different scenarios is, uh, it's a bit of a challenge, but it's something that we and a lot of others, I think, are up to. Yeah. So I guess like a, a follow-up question to that, is there a way that you can sort of tease out the human microbes to say the other microbes that came from the area? Is it just kind of like, this is what we know is in human, so we're going to filter for that? Or can you really only do it if you're specifically looking for, say, COVID populations or another microbe population? So in this case, we're basically filtering down to just COVID. I think it gets dangerous trying to make assumptions about where a given microbe came from once it's in sewage. We know a lot about the microbiome, but I, I always think we know a lot less than we don't know, kind of. You know, I think I think it's kind of still very much a frontier of science. So I don't like to make I don't like to make any assumptions if I can avoid it. You know, if we see if we see E. coli that we typically see in humans, and I can, you know, as a bioinformatician, I'm more than willing to assign it a probability and say it's probably from human. But especially things like bacteria that tend to be very adaptable. You know, we usually think of salmonella as something that lives in, you know, it lives in lizards, it lives in birds, it doesn't really live as much in humans. But there's salmonellas that definitely live in humans and like to hang out in humans. Right. And agriculture. Yeah, exactly. Well, that agriculture is mostly thanks to humans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, So at Microbi Gals, we are obsessed with microbes and some of the greatest ways humans interact with the unseen world is through taste. And so I'm curious, what is your favorite microbe inspired food or drink? So have you ever heard of a product called corn? It's mycoprotein. Yes, I have. The Q-U-O-R-N, right? Yes. It's, I know it's more popular. It's been more popular in Europe than the U S but it's starting to catch on here. I thought that was absolutely brilliant because there's always the challenge of, you know, we can grow up food very quickly that produces a lot of uh, carbohydrate and sometimes lipid, but it's a lot more energy inefficient to try and grow up food that contains a lot of protein because typically that's animals or animal products. So the idea that you can, you can basically take, you know, leftover wheat or whatever other carbohydrate rich product you have and grow up I think it's a species of fusarium uh, basically just ferment it with this fusarium and basically the fibers from the fungus are protein and they're very similar in nature to the actin fibers one would typically find in animal protein but generated with much more uh, kind of energy efficiency 
is really cool. Yeah. So for, for people that don't know, corn is, it's a company that uses myco protein. So fungi to help grow vegetarian. I think they're vegan protein sources. So they have like chicken and, and they have like little burgers, I think as well as the corn one, chicken nuggets, Wh- which one's your favorite? Um, let's see, probably the chicken strips. I've actually, um, cause that's the one where, um, I made dinner for my parents, uh, uh, last time I was out there, which was before COVID, um, made dinner for them and actually used the uh, corn chicken strips. You know, I made some blackened corn chicken strips, put it in a salad. They could not even tell that it wasn't real chicken. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you tell them. And then of course they automatically know and make a big deal about it. But yeah, I've done the same same thing. So are you a vegetarian or do you just like exploring your meat alternatives? I'm not a vegetarian, but I do appreciate the fact that that are basically the way that we're the way that we're dealing food is not the way that we're dealing with food right now is not good for the environment and quite frankly our broad spectrum hamburgers are not good for the world's microbiome the amount of antibiotics people are throwing into uh animal feeding is going to come back to bite us or it's already back to bite us but it's going to just keep biting us harder right for sure yeah i think agricultural systems are often neglected but it, it's they need to come back in a big way and we need to figure that out to do anything for climate change or any sort of um, living more sustainably. I think agriculture is where it's at. That's only slightly biased because that's the field of research that I'm in. But (laughs) so along those lines, what is your favorite microbe or favorite microbe function? Hmm. I'd say type three and type four secretion systems and things along those lines, because it's basically a microbial hypodermic needle. Type four that shows up a lot, uh, that's basically a whole system for agro right now, right? Uh, you're, you're basically hijacking the type four secretion to get DNA into uh, plant cells. Is that correct? Yeah, with agrobacterium. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and then type three, th- type three shows up a lot in, in uh, uh, bacteria that are attacking animal cells. Um, as a way, so type three injects protein. Um, and so this, the bacteria will just kind of dock to the cell. And I know that, um, I know that for example, uh, in whooping cough, those, those bacteria, basically they just inject stuff into cells that line the lung. And essentially you just see the cell collapse over the next like 30 minutes. Wow. Is that fast? I didn't realize it was that fast. It's incredibly fast. I, I think it's like over the course of minutes where the cytoskeleton just kind of collapses on itself. Wow. That's crazy. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more of what a day in the life of a bioinformatician is like. So in my case, because I have a few different roles, my days tend to be very different. Kind of, I guess, over the summer, my focus has been, uh, so I've had two major uh, things that I focused on. At the beginning of every summer, I teach as as part of a program at UCLA called uh, Bruins in Genomics, uh, also known as, uh, as Big Summer. It's kind of a cool program. Uh, We bring in students from all over the country, uh, including we actually have one grant that specifically brings in a large number of students from uh, historically black colleges and universities, and they can do a several week intensive at UCLA uh, just in bioinformatics in a bunch of different fields ranging from epigenetics to precision medicine to, you know, hardcore data science, whatever, you know, pretty much whichever labs are looking for people to do a summer project. Oh, so you link them up with labs. And so it's like a little internship too. Yeah. So the way the program actually works is they have a two week kind of bioinformatics and computational biology intensive. So I always teach during the first week and I teach intro to next generation sequencing. I also just kind of help orient them to UCLA and to LA in general. Didn't do that last year, didn't do that this year because uh, we obviously ran remote, but I'm looking forward to doing that again next year. Um, So two week intensive. And then after that, they get assigned out to labs and they have basically a six week uh, research project to work on. It's a really cool program. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. So when, when it's in person, they get subsidized housing around campus. uh, I think some of the grants give a stipend um, and even sometimes funding for computer upgrades for students who come in without you know, without particularly good computers. And actually the program is doing its last week this week. So um, later this week, I'm going to be probably attending some of the remote sessions, looking at their, uh, at their research posters and checking out the awards and that kind of thing. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty cool. What's the, what's the name of that program? Big Summer. It stands for Bruins in Genomics uh, Summer Program. Interesting. And how big is usually each cohort? Is it pretty small or is it like hundreds? 
So it's grown. I remember when the program first started. When the program first started, it was om- it was probably majority, if not almost entirely, HBCU students, uh, historically Black College and University. But it was so successful and so popular that they just they were bringing in students from many, many different sources, uh, many, many different sources. I've been teaching for them since the program first started. So I've been with them for about five or six years, I guess. But yeah, it's kind of cool now because I'm seeing a lot of those students go off and, you know, some of them might have spent a little time in industry, but a lot of them are now going on to, uh, are now going on to grad schools and that kind of stuff. So I'm kind of following them on LinkedIn, watching like, you know, seeing some of them become like, you know, really promising cancer researchers and that kind of thing. So it's really cool. Wow. Yeah. That's gotta be pretty cool. Yeah. And then and then outside of the teaching um, at Zymo, a lot of times my focus is um, developing bioinformatic methods. So do you, uh, do you actually do 16S sequencing or what's your major? Yeah, I do I do 16S and 18S sequencing in agricultural settings. Do you do ASV or OTU based? ASV. Are you using Data2? Yes. <laughs> so how do you set your trimming parameters in Data2? <laughs> Um, it depends. I think, I mean, it depends on the sequences a lot. Yeah. For data two pipeline, being able to set good trimming parameters, especially if you're doing really long applicon, I was seeing a lot of people who they couldn't find good trimming parameters. So a lot of times they were tolerant. They were just tolerating the fact that they'd lose like, you know, they'd lose like 70% of their reads at the merge step. Um, so one of the things that I do, and I actually still text, I still actually answer support questions. I was actually answering a support question on this. I made a program called Figaro. Mm -hmm. And Figaro will actually do error modeling on the reads and it'll kind of figure out the accumulation of errors over the length of your reads. Mm -hmm. It'll tell you where the optimal trimming point is to have adequate overlap while still trimming off the kind of maximum amount of poor quality read. And then what to set your expected error at in data two so that you can, you can basically keep as much read as possible while still keeping the read, the read filtering as high quality as you can. Wow, that sounds pretty interesting. I'll have to look that up and try it on my sequences, see how it changes the results. Yeah, it works pretty well. The only rule with it is you just you can't be using sequences that are pre-trimmed, right? Because obviously, I don't wanna, I don't necessarily want to try and do error modeling when you when something has already potentially come in and trimmed off uh, poor quality read. But yeah, it's made a huge difference for a lot of people. And actually, the other nice thing is it also improves reproducibility of data two pipelines because the uh, Instead of doing trial and error or using the uh, trimming parameters that kind of somebody else was using, you kind of have an objective system to optimize it specifically to your read set and rerunning it on your read set will always give you the same set of trimming parameters. So I, I still tech support that. Um, I also do a lot of tech support for customers and um, still work to develop uh, bioinformatic apps and that sort of thing. Um, so part of my role is also just customer success, customer success and giving people advice on how to kind of make the best uh, bioinformatic pipe, you know, do the best bioinformatic and microbiome analysis they can. Where, where's your base? Do you have like an office at both Zymo and UCLA? Uh, so the nice thing is Zymo is just in Orange County, California. Uh, UCLA is, I think, maybe 50 or so miles straight up the freeway. So if there's, you know, in the unlikely event that there's very little traffic. <laughs> Never happens. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's, there's some very specific times where I kind of know I can reliably get back here. Like if I drive it, if I drive at 10 at night, it's pretty, it's usually pretty quick. Right. Yeah. So at Zymo, I have, you know, I have my desk, I have, you know, lab, that kind of thing. So when I'm teaching, I'm usually just teaching a three-day workshop. Um, all the, all the courses I teach are three-day workshops. So uh, when I'm teaching at UCLA, I'm just up there for three days. And actually some of those days I teach two of them. So I'm teaching for about six hours straight. Uh, so during that time, UCLA, um, they don't pay, uh, t- my teaching is voluntary, but UCLA does provide me with a, uh, with an on-campus, uh, or at least near campus hotel room. So usually I just stay up there for a couple of days. Oh, okay. That makes sense. So I know you mentioned that you said you were involved in cybersecurity before you came into to microbiology. What is, I was wondering, what is your, your micro moment? What is the spark that lit your microbiology fire? I guess one of those was actually just starting to learn some of the bioinformatics. And I've, I've always been very impressed by kind of the shift from OTU to ASV, just kind of conceptually, it's the idea of, you know, we know we have a noisy image, you know, we know we have like a noisy picture, it's grainy, there's little speckles on it, that kind of thing. And the way we used to deal with it was the OTU approach, which is just saying, I'm going to kind of blur this image a little bit. Because yes, I'll lose resolution on the image and it won't be as sharp, but it's also going to blur out all the noise and the noise goes away. 
And then the ASV approach says, I'm going to use a few more compute cycles, and I'm going to mathematically identify what's probably just a spec or what's probably just you know noise. And I'm just going to mathematically remove those things from the image so that all I'm left with is a sharp image with things with things left behind that I know are supported as part of the image. That was kind of part of it. And then also, I always like finding parallels between um, kind of the natural microbial world and kind of the world of cybersecurity. Can you give us an example? Uh, sure. So I think kind of the relationship with the immune system is very interesting because in a way, you know, we always think of the, um, we always think of the innate immune system as, you know, the thing that kind of developed first. And then the adaptive immune system is something that kind of developed, that kind of developed or evolved later. In computers, they had actually the more specific adaptive immune system early on, which is kind of the old antiviruses. And then the newer antiviruses are innate immune system. They always talk about pathogen associated molecular patterns. So stuff that looks like it belongs to bacteria or viruses that don't really belong. That kind of approach in computing is more recent. And that's where we have kind of our next generation antiviruses. They're not necessarily looking for any specific virus, although they will identify if they say, hey, this is this file is a known virus. But they're also looking at things like, hey, this document you just opened is trying to take over your computer and trying to issue all kinds of weird commands to your computer's kernel. And I should probably shut that down because that's probably not really a legitimate document. So in this case, it's looking for basically pathogen associated behavioral patterns, but it's working just like, you know, it's, it's the latest technology, but it actually works a lot like the um, innate immune system does. Yeah. Oh yeah. I never thought of it like that. So I, I, w- I wonder if you had any thoughts on what the future of microbiome research is going to look like? Yeah, I think I think the direction it's going right now is everybody's trying to kind of get, you know, we have a ton of research being done. At this point, we have relatively few things being kind of applied clinically, which I think is where I think it's where everybody wants to start applying first because that's where the money is. And I'm starting to see things also show up now agriculturally where people are trying to push uh, microbiome based soil conditioners and that kind of thing. So I think where it's going to go is first, everybody's going to try and get their clinical application out because that's typically where you're going to basically be able to get a lot of money without, you know, that's basically where a lot of people just see the money right now. And I think they're probably not entirely wrong, but at this point, at this point, you know, people are still trying to figure out how to regulate it, how to evaluate those things. But I think that's kind of where the push is right now. And I think, so I think one of the first things that's going to happen is they're going to kind of start coming up with standards for evidence and standards for uh, practices and benchmarking so that people can kind of get these things evaluated by the FDA and have reproducible, you know, reproducible and comparable measurements. And then likewise, I think it's going to become an even bigger deal for um, agriculture soon because, you know, we can't manually go through huge amounts of soil and try and recondition it for, you know, changing conditions uh, that are coming about with climate change. Climate change happens and suddenly the soil is drier, the pH of the soil changes, and, you know, what was once really good soil, now all of a sudden, for example, it, you know, at weird pHs and weird drynesses, um, things like the aluminum in the soil suddenly become very toxic to plants. Is there a way to microbial condition the soil to either try and push back on those changes or to try and maybe detoxify the aluminum or to get the plants or a microbe that you can associate with the plants that will just protect them from the aluminum toxicity? Yeah. Yeah, I love that answer because it's job security for me. So <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Love it. Job security for job security is great. Yeah, yeah. I think agriculture is going to be the next big thing for sure. At least I hope so. Yeah, I've actually yeah I've actually just started talking a lot more to um, some of the major uh, agricultural companies. Weirdly enough, this doesn't even come from um, this doesn't actually even come from. Uh, directly from Zymo. This is actually one of the major agriculture companies. Uh, one of their leaders is actually just a guy who I know from uh, middle school gym class. What? Small world, huh? That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So we reconnected and he's, and you know, I'm working on microbiome research and I find out that he, you know, the company he's with is starting to look very intently at some of these microbiome based uh, agricultural products like soil conditioners and that sort of thing. So it's like, Oh, we should definitely get together sometime because there's a few things I could teach you about how to evaluate some of these products and how some of these products are going to work. 
because I think up to this point, they were just selling Beethringiensis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is the most popular one, I guess, that and, and Streptomyces right now. And of course, Rhizobium, but mm-hmm. Rhizobium is like the E. coli of the agricultural yeah. world, I think. Maybe Agrobacterium is because that's <laughs> more bioengineering, but analogies. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess one of them just sort of one of them has E. coli's job in the real world and one of them has E. coli's job in the lab. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> it makes sense. So I was wondering because I was looking on your LinkedIn. I was doing a little LinkedIn stalking and uh, I noticed that you got your your undergraduate, your graduate degree and you did a postdoc at UCLA, right? Uh-huh. So you're like a lifetime ucla Mhm. Because I did the same thing. I did my postdoc in the same lab I did the graduate school in. And everyone was like, that's such a bad idea. You should not stay at the same university with the same professor and the same location when you move up in the academic ladder. Uh, what's your sort of take on that? What's your response to those those kinds of statements? So, well, I guess there's a couple things on it. Number one, um, yeah, the people who told me that it was career suicide for some reason so first, a bunch of people complained when I was doing my undergrad and then my PhD at the same university. And yet I, I worked on an absolutely phenomenal project as a PhD student. The protein that we character that we kind of characterized and the function of it we discovered is something that the lipid metabolism field had been hypothesizing and looking for for about uh, two or three decades. Wow. So we start publishing on this and really showing the evidence for it. And a lot of people noticed. And Actually, if I had stayed, if I had wanted to stay in strictly lipid research, I would have left, I would have probably left UCLA. There's a really good lipid research area in Dallas. Wasn't entirely sure I wanted to move to Texas, to be honest. <laughs> it's a big move. Yeah, it's a, it's a big move. Yeah, it's a big move. I have, you know, I have a lot of family around the LA area. I wanted to stay close to them. I was taking care of my grandparents at the time too. I stayed at UCLA and actually when I finished my PhD, I was actually looking to leave UCLA. Um, in fact, I had actually basically spoken with and, accept and agreed on a research position, a postdoc position with a genetics lab at uh, Cedar sinai Hospital. However, in the time between when I took the position and when I actually joined the lab, the lab moved to UCLA. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's crazy. What a coincidence. Yeah, but it turned out that was really good because I have, I, you know, I had a lot of friends at UCLA. So at the time I started my postdoc, I wasn't actually doing much in the way of bioinformatics. It was actually during my postdoc that a couple of the cases I was working on, I had to analyze some patient exomes. And that basically got me starting to code again. And I started, you know, just picking up really quickly and accelerating with it. And then at some point, uh, at some point started actually teaching it a lot. And what's kind of interesting about that is I've noticed this pattern. There's a lot of women who are excellent programmers and a lot of excellent programmers are usually taken up by, you know, the gaming industry, by, by video game production, but a lot of video game production. And I think we're seeing that right now with um, one local company in particular has kind of gotten reputation for toxic behavior towards uh, women in their workplace. So I've seen a lot of women who actually got turned away from programming by having encountered that early on, but then they end up getting, you know, they still want to work in hard sciences and a lot of them go into things like physics and a lot of them go into biology and they start, you know, and they're still really good programmers and now they become very good bioinformaticians. So what's interesting is all of my, um, all of my early bioinformatics mentors were actually all women. Oh, really? Yeah. That's so cool. And then I also realized that there were a lot of people in going into biology who for various reasons didn't go into computers, either, um, either they didn't grow up with them because, you know, maybe didn't have the resources for it, or they got turned away from, you know, they got turned away from some of the industries because of uh, behavior they didn't like, but I got heavily into teaching during that time, which ends up also just kind of building up my own skills. And that's basically when I started teaching bioinformatics and I'm still, and that's a program I'm still uh, very much teaching with. So you would say it was not career suicide at all to stay at UCLA, no regrets? Absolutely none. Yeah. Did you find it beneficial in a lot of ways? Like, could you focus on research more because you already knew more about the area or did you have a jump start because you already had a foundation or did you find it, it probably didn't matter if you moved? Because I was already at UCLA and especially with my, t- with my postdoc, because the lab had just moved to UCLA in my postdoc, I was doing some research involving mice and also some research involving human subjects. And I already kind of had the institutional knowledge. So it's kind of like, I already knew the IRB. I already knew the animal committee. I already knew environmental health and safety. And, you know, if, you know, if you want to do something involving 
you know, hazardous chemicals or involving, involving human samples with potentially bloodborne pathogens, there's always paperwork involved. And I don't think anybody likes the paperwork, although having been around during some times of major lab accidents, I can appreciate some of the oversight. It's nice having been there that long that I generally knew, you know, if I had, if I had an animal protocol that I wanted to get the needed review, I generally knew who I could call. And if I needed, you know, if I needed something reviewed more quickly, I generally knew who, like, you know, I knew who I could bake cookies for or something. <laughs> right. Yeah. I've, I've definitely found that that's true. Like you're, I already have projects started. So even though I did my PH or my postdoc, the same place I did my PhD, it, it's actually helpful because I don't, I'm not starting from square zero. Right. I'm, I already have uh, the knowledge base to sort of move forward, which I think is nice. And I also hope it's not career suicide. I don't think it is, but um, still, still time to tell, I guess. Can't say that quite yet. I was going to say, one thing I've learned is honestly, a lot of, a lot of people who are reviewing um, CVs and applications, I sometimes get the impression that they can count more than they can read. And I've actually even seen somebody reviewing, reviewing somebody's CV on an application where they literally just had different journal names and tallies next to oh, them. Wow. So they, do they care about impact factor then, or is it just like how many? It, it kind of was that. So this was somebody who was actually a very good candidate and they, and they did have some major publications. So like I saw, I saw a line at the top that was actually, you know, it was science slash nature and it had, and it had three tick marks next to it. And then I, and then I saw, you know, another line that had a couple of journals that were kind of a, a, a level lower. And then I, and then they had basically a third line. So it seemed like they were just breaking down into three tiers of journal and just counting how many publications a person had in each. Well, you know, I got a lot of applications to go through. It's a good way, I guess, to filter people out quickly. Yeah. And I have a feeling if I, if I had asked that person, do you know where this, do you know where this candidate got their PhD? They would probably just look at me like, eh, I wasn't paying too much attention to that. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't yeah. matter. They have a science paper. <laughs> So a lot of times I feel like as early career scientists, when you're in your PhD or your postdoc, you're kind of deciding between the biggest question is always like academia or industry. Uh, and you've chosen both. Uh, so what is that? Did you mean to kind of choose both paths? Did you ever have that kind of argument with yourself about which way to go or did you just, it just kind of all fell into place? So in my case, I, I still consider myself now primarily industry. I, I'm not involved in like the typical academic research, although people from UCLA still know me and occasionally call on me when they know I can help with something. But I mean, to be honest, I'm not, I was never a huge fan of the grant writing process. Yeah. I don't know many people who are actually. Yeah. I, I've known a few people who've actually gotten careers writing grants because I wouldn't say they like it, but they can tolerate it and they got good at it. But yeah. And then the other thing also was you know, I was transitioning out of my postdoc during uh, the Trump administration and research funding was just getting cut left and right. So it was looking at a situation where it's kind of like, well, I already don't like grant writing. I like writing, you know, I like writing bioinformatics apps. I like writing code. I could probably become, you know, I could probably become a PI. And in that case, I'd probably spend the rest of my career writing grants because the pay lines are so bad right now that, and they're not looking bad. You know, I imagine they're going to get better, but at the time they were definitely not good. And so it's kind of like, well, I'll be just writing grants year in and year out with about a 10% success rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a high, high percentage of rejection. Yeah. And then I said, or alternatively, I can go into industry, try and work on solving some of the, some of the similar problems. And actually Zymo was very cool when I applied because they, they saw the potential synergy between my teaching and my efforts here. And that is actually, it's definitely paid off. If, for example, somebody here wants to know, hey, what are people who are starting to get into sequencing, you know, what kind of stuff are they studying? Or, you know, somebody who's just now getting into microbiome, what kind of research are they doing? I can actually somewhat answer those questions and say things like, well, you know, I've noticed that my microbiome class, I've gotten a bunch of people registering from the dental school. So apparently oral microbiomes are becoming a hot topic. But then the other thing also is it makes me, you know, because I'm teaching because I'm teaching some fairly complicated topics and I'm teaching them to people who are all relatively new. So a lot of my students in my classes are actually people who are, they're at the bench. They have typically, especially for my intro to NGS class, they have almost no bioinformatics experience. It helps kind of keep my science communication skills uh, on point as much as possible. Yeah. And, and they can go pretty quick science communication skills. Yeah. Oh yeah. And so, so few scientists I feel have good, good science communication skills. Yeah, we're, we're suffering for that now in the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was one of the biggest things that for me was very striking in the pandemic was 
man, we're really not good at informing the public and educating and sharing information. So, but I think, I think we're on the right track now. I think we're going to get better. I think so. I mean, you know, for example, a more current example I can see of that is the number of people who understand that the Delta COVID variant just really differs by basically a couple letter changes in, in one protein is, is really the big consequence versus the number of people who think it's a very different virus. The spike protein looks nothing alike and there's no vaccine, you know, and there's no way the vaccine could possibly cover it. It, it, you know, the, the number of people who are in the first camp versus the second is, is a little bit disturbing right now. (laughs) Yeah, a little bit. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So for, I wonder if you have any advice for people who are looking to become bioinformaticians within industry advice or, or resources, I guess as well. I guess the advice right now would be frankly, just would honestly be just do it. Cause right now, you know, right now, pretty much anybody who has bioinformatics training, who's trying to get into industry, industry, industry will fight for you. So a lot of biotech and biomed and biomed right now, the industries are kind of a wash in money from uh, a lot of the COVID efforts. And a lot of them have made plans to expand things, including, and a lot of the expansion plans now involve sequencing. And if they involve sequencing, then they pretty much require bioinformatics. So yeah, as far as advice goes, um, I actually, there's quite a few people who either are already in industry or were looking to get industry, but they hadn't had a lot of the formal training in bioinformatics and they felt like they were coming in at a disadvantage. But if somebody's willing to put in the time, you can actually get the training online for very little. I think one of the people who I helped get started, who became like a full-fledged industry bioinformatician from uh, basically scratch. Uh, He was willing to put in the work, but honestly, the expense involved in there was somewhere in the neighborhood of like 50 bucks, I think. Wow. Yeah. So it's very affordable. Yeah. It was, it was 50 bucks worth of online courses where he basically got from, he got very proficient in Python programming and he got much more proficient in statistics so he came in already knowing the biology. He gained the programming knowledge and the computer science knowledge. He gained the, the statistics knowledge. He started using a program called, for example, uh, Rosalind, which once you once you know statistics and once you know, uh, especially once you know programming, Rosalind will give you bioinformatics uh, programming challenges to try and solve. And they start you off super simple. You know, can you can we give you a DNA sequence and can you give us back a reverse complement? And it starts with that and it'll start going, you know, and then it starts going into much harder, um, much more, you know, much more complicated bioinformatics topics where you start learning actual algorithms. Yeah. So how long did it take him to go from, from start to bioinformatician? He became pretty respect, respectable in that in the field within about a year. And then, you know, within about two years, he was, you know, full, you know, I would consider him as much a bioinformatician as anybody else. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's pretty fast, pretty cheap. Mm-hmm. Not easy, but put in the what nothing is. Yeah, the the way the way I like to explain it to people, I know a lot of people who who have the bio who have the biology background who are nervous about getting into bioinformatics because it looks really difficult. I think it's actually easier to train somebody who has a biology background to do more uh, computational bio and bioinformatics than it is to take somebody who is a mathematician and computer scientist and get them understanding biology to where they're to where I would consider them a good bioinformatician. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say in my own experience with, with trying to teach myself bioinformatics, I feel like I wasted years in the fact that I just had this mindset, this barrier up that this was too hard. And I was just a biologist and I couldn't get, I couldn't do it. And I think like once I just took that down, I was like, well, maybe this isn't too hard for me and I can learn it. And I think that was the switch that a lot of people need in order to actually get to learn new things. I, I don't think, I don't believe like when we get older, we, we can't learn as fast. We can't learn as much. I just think we have more barriers that we've created for ourselves that limit our own potentials. Yeah. I've, I seen that too. And actually what's interesting is one person who essentially kind of stated agreement to that is the guy who wrote Linux. Uh, so Linus Torvalds actually has kind of a famous quote where he said the difference between a good programmer and a bad programmer is a good programmer is very focused in understanding of the data structures and their their interactions. And a mediocre programmer is very focused on the code itself. And I find, and to somebody who's worked for years in biology, who actually very, you know, who very thoroughly understands, you know, DNA to DNA interactions and understands translation and transcription, 
you know, under, understands introns and exons is going to have a much easier time dealing with the data sets and being able to abstract the data sets into code once they know how to code. Because really, the the math and the stats and the coding, it follows a very strict logic and it doesn't really, it doesn't really stray from that in a lot of cases. Yeah. But biology is messy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, computer science, you basically have to spend a four-year degree learning all the rules. And, but then once you learn all the rules, you kind of have all the rules. In biology, you spend, I like to say you spend, you know, the first two years of your undergrad degree um, learning the rules. You spend the latter half of your undergrad degree learning uh, some of the big exceptions, and then you spend your graduate degree finding new exceptions. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a pretty good way to uh, sum it up. I think I definitely fell into that that pattern. So I want to thank you so much, Michael, for coming on to our show, The Micro Moment. My pleasure. I was wondering if there's anything you'd like to plug before we go. Obviously, I'll plug Zymo kits and, you know, Zymo uh, microbiome services. If you want to do your own, we have kits for it. As I mentioned, I also have some bioinformatics tools that I just make open source. And are those on like a GitHub? Yes, those are on GitHub. And then if you're just starting off a project and you, you know, you don't even have the equipment, maybe um, we also have microbiome services where we can do everything from the extraction to the analysis. And, you know, we basically just send you the collection vessels. So plug that, obviously. Um and then I will also plug the our collection our collection supplies as well. So DNA, RNA, shield, the preservative, and that sort of thing. I'll also plug uh, UCLA's Big Summer Program. Uh, I think it's a great program, and it's definitely gotten a lot of uh, students trained in bioinformatics who otherwise may not have had the opportunities. Yeah, that sounds like an excellent initiative. Oh, and also plug tardigrades just because they're freaking rad. I appreciate that. Yeah, plug the tardigrades. Yeah, so thank you so much. All right. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Bye. Well, that's the end of our show. I hope you enjoyed it and learned as much as I did from Michael. And I hope you continue listening. As always, you can find us at microbials.com. That's M-I-C-R-O-B-I-G-A-L-S dot com. So on the show so far, we have talked about being a medical writer, a science writer. We have an illustrator coming up. We've talked about becoming an entrepreneur as well as a bioinformatician. We even have a liberal arts professor coming up. But I'm curious, what other careers are there for microbiologists? Tell me what you do or what you'd like to see on Microbigals by sending us a Gmail at microbigals at gmail.com. Again, that's M-I-C-R-O-B-I-G-A-L-S at gmail.com. We'd love to explore further careers and help other microbiologists or PhD students find the right path for them. Until next time, bye!